Hello, I am here. I have a cold and we're doing this. Cold aside, I am actually so excited to film this video, but before I do, I feel like I just have to have a mandatory trauma dump for a second. So if you don't care about my personal life and don't want to hear me complain, just skip ahead. But for those of you who might be interested in why this video is such a dumpster fire, here you go. So for the past couple of years, I've been taking this drug called Effexor and good stuff good stuff um, especially with therapy two thumbs up for me for sure but a couple months ago there was an issue with the pharmacy where I was supposed to get a refill and I didn't and I ended up going a couple days off of my medication by mistake and if that's never happened to you with Effexor I can tell you it was one of the worst experiences I've had in my life and that includes um, the experiences that made me get on the drug in the first place. And basically ever since that happened, I've been slowly trying to work myself off of it so that I don't have to experience it again. And I'm now getting to the point where I'm basically off of it and I'm starting to get like those like, withdrawal symptoms again. Obviously nowhere near as bad, but it has not been pleasant. Uh, I can tell you that much. And on top of that, I got this lovely cold. So my notes for researching this video were particularly unhinged and particularly out of pocket. And I just feel like I have been in a walking dream state for the past three weeks, which has been both good and bad um, for watching the show. And so yeah, um, I guess I just wanted to use the story to say, take your medication and if you want to take less of it, talk to your doctor about it because um, if you don't, you will get very, very sick and it is not fun. But the good news is I have had today's topic to get me through this hellscape of the past couple of weeks. So if you couldn't already tell, today we are going to be diving into... That was a horrible wink. <laughs> we are going to be diving into one of Australia's hit TV shows, H2O Just Add Water. And this video was originally going to be my thoughts on the entire show, all three seasons of the original show. Um, and then I thought it would just be seasons one and two, since realistically those are the two that I watched when I was a kid. And then I realized I just had too many thoughts on every single episode. And this video is hopefully going to be all my thoughts on season one condensed into one piece of media. And I'm honestly so happy that the show has gotten a resurgence just from TikTok and Netflix because this was one of like my holy grail shows when I was a kid. Like y'all probably don't know, but when I was a kid, I was on the swim team. I was a lifeguard for several years. I wanted to be a marine biologist for a little while. My birth chart is just all big sad water energy. I've just always been the girl who wanted to play mermaids as a kid. And so this show just hit that itch in my brain where I was just like bound to be obsessed as clearly so many other people were. And what I now know is that H2O was originally pitched to be a boy-led show about a teenage boy and a pet shark and there would be some sort of fantasy element put into that. And that show actually did get made in the spin-off H2O show, Mako Island. But the H2O we know today actually came from the executive producer reading bedtime stories to her two daughters. And one of those stories happened to be about a girl who turned into a mermaid. And basically, as soon as she pitched that to the network, they were all in on this idea. And it also seems like this production company seemed to have a thing for ocean media because they had also just finished making a show called Ocean Girl which from what I could find was just about a group of scientists studying girl a girl in the ocean. And from my memory of the early 2000s we really did seem to be going through like a weird mermaid phase as a society because we had the little mermaid in the 90s and then we had aquamarine and then I also remember reading a book about like a feral child who's raised by dolphins does anyone else remember this? Yes, okay, it, it is a real thing. It's called Miracle of the Dolphins, following Mila, a feral child raised by a pod of dolphins off the coast of Florida. Of course it was Florida. Yeah, but that is to say that that is how the show was born. And I also didn't realize at the time that the creative executive producer for this show was only 23 years old when he started and he was directing a bunch of 16 year olds. So this all just kind of feels like it was one big summer camp that they just filmed in 2006 one day. And I found these really cute pictures of the girls um, when they first got cast. And just look at them, little babies. And for my fellow theme park enthusiasts out there, the show was filmed in large part at Warner Brothers Movie World and SeaWorld. And it seems like the cast basically all just share different hotel rooms and would all hang out after filming and get into their like typical teen shenanigans. You know, I'm sure there were some grueling days of filming this project, but honestly, like, how fun must this have been for just like a first major role? But what is this show anyways? Well, the show followed three girls, Cleo, Emma, and Ricky, who all became mermaids together one night. And the show is about them trying to balance living a normal teenage life with 
secretly being mermaids with crazy superpowers. So you've got your good combination of like typical teen drama of boys and dances and after school jobs with also like these superhero hijinks mixed in. And season one especially is just all about the friendship between these three girls as they try and manage their powers and figure out what it's like to be a mermaid and three pretty teenage girls all at the same time. I don't know how they do it. So I thought I would just walk you through episode by episode what exactly happens in the show because it is that important. The show opens with Ema, I can't do an Australian accent even when I'm not sick so I don't know why I tried, swimming laps for regionals and then Cleo is timing her but forget all about that because uh, we immediately cut to the next scene where Cleo is walking down the marina when a boy named Zane calls her over to see if she can help him fix his boat. Now Zane is a true menace to society, especially in the first half of season one. And it's never really explained, but early on, Zane seems to have like a weird obsession with physically harming Cleo. And we just like never get any, any reason, any justification for that. We just have to accept that that's how it is. But anyways, Zane is willing to commit full on manslaughter over his hatred for Cleo. And we're all just supposed to be like, well, that's Zane for ya. Anyways, Zane sends Cleo adrift to sea. Cleo is floating out into the ocean, but luckily my favorite character is here to save the day. Nah, no spark plug, no spark. I was getting sick of that thing anyway. Why me? I didn't steal your spark plug. Because you're here, Cleo. <laughs> Is this supposed to be some sort of rescue? Because there's a fatal flaw here. I don't mean to state the obvious, but we're just floating out to sea. Both of us. Ricky is everyone's favorite angry bisexual. Or she's at least my favorite angry bisexual. And it turns out that she's the one who messed up Sane's boat. So the girlies commit boat theft, which from what I could find lands you a max of two years in prison, but Ricky is not phased by criminal liability. Emma eventually joins in on the boat theft and the girls are riding out to sea when they run out of fuel just short of Mako Island. Feel like paddling to that island? Mako Island? Forget it. No one goes there. It's surrounded by sharks and reefs and mangroves. And drop bears and hoop snakes and chemical runoff and Loch Ness Monsters. Emma can't get a signal so they try and go further into the island to see if they can reach higher ground and they do some sick parkour when Cleo falls through a tunnel. Mind your step. I can't do this, it's too slippery. And the other two decide that the best way that they can help is to immediately follow her into the tunnel. And like, y'all, what was the plan here? If there wasn't a magical mermaid pool, like, you would all be dead, right? Wow. But the girlies need to escape, and so they hop into the moon pool, and just as they're getting ready to swim out, we see the moon go over the pool and start to bubble. seem super safe and super normal. Luckily, the girls make it out and they're immediately saved by the water police. Australia, is the water police a real name? I don't know, I just like the name Australian water police is just not instilling confidence in me. And the next day, they're all going about their business when each of them touch water and, uh-oh, they're mermaids.
Also, I saw an interview with the executive producer and she originally wanted it to be that they turn into mermaids when they touch salt water so that the plot of the show would be a little bit less ridiculous. Um, but ultimately they decided that it made more made for more fun hijinks if it just had them turn into mermaids the second any water touched them. And they all fully acknowledge that it makes no sense. And I won't harp on every single time that it makes no sense, but sometimes the writers of the show do leave me no choice, and I will say that. And while the girlies are discussing their new tale, uh, my favorite character decides to walk in. And I know I said Ricky is my favorite character, but you can't make me choose between these two, all right? Clay up. Uh, did I get the time wrong? No, we said nine. Oh. But, sorry, Lewis, something has come up. Sorry, Lewis. I have to cancel. Oh. Um, maybe some other time? Lewis? You're smart. Do you know anything about mermaids? No, not really. Okay, sorry. Bye. Okay, so I was looking on Pinterest to make the thumbnail for this video, and I found a quiz which says, which H2O character should you worship as a god? And naturally, I had to take it. And I wasn't that surprised when I got Lewis as the answer, like, makes sense to me. But what I loved is at the end, I found out that you could only get Lewis as the option for like eight out of nine choices, and there's like a slight chance you get Kim. And I just think that that is the appropriate result. So I highly encourage you all to take this quiz. It's linked down below. And Cleo very subtly asked Lewis if he knows anything about mermaids. And like the respectful king that he is, he starts researching it for her. Y'all, I love Lewis so much, but the girls are like, we cannot tell anyone that we are mermaids, not even our parents. Which, okay, I get wanting to have like as few people know as possible. Like it's, it's riskier if more people know, but you will see throughout the show, multiple people find out and it is never considered that they could tell their parents at some point. And I don't know, it just seems more risky to tell like your high school boyfriend one of your deepest secrets when it's like, at least you know that their parents are gonna like, love and care for them you know for years and years like if my shitty high school boyfriend knew my deepest darkest secrets and i still had to deal with him 10 years later i'd be a little annoyed about it i don't know it just seems strange to me but also half the conflict in the show is the parents trying to put them around water and them being like no i can't be around water and the parents being like why do you hate us um so i guess this show would be a lot shorter if they knew Anyways, Lewis and Cleo are talking about some of the research that Lewis has done when they come across Zane again. Oh no. And seriously, he is willing to commit some serious crimes and I just want to say, seek help Zane. I don't know what to tell you. But this is where we find out that the girls aren't just mermaids, they have special powers. It's not going to do you any good. You know Cleo, one of these days, with or without Lewis. Something really bad might happen to you. So Cleo can move water with her mind, Emma can freeze things, and we find out later that Ricky can boil things. And may I just say that Ricky got robbed here? Because throughout the show, you'll see Emma freeze like molecules in the air to like jam blocks or just like break things open by freezing them. And being able to move water around like also is really cool and has a lot of different uses, but like Ricky, she can either give people third degree burns or she can make ramen wherever she wants. Those are her two options. I mean, she can dry herself on her own, so I guess that's convenient, but seriously, she has the least fun powers. Anyways, that is episode one. Um, I'm not gonna be going as in depth with the descriptions of every single episode, but you know, I just wanted to lay that foundation for all of us here. Episode two, pool party. So in the beginning, Emma and Ricky are really excited about being mermaids and Cleo is having none of it. And they find out that moisturizer turns them into mermaids because it's 60% water. And again, this is where the writers take it too far for me because you know what else are 60% water? Humans. So if they get touched by someone, do they turn into mermaids? It's like this one throwaway line single-handedly just like opened the floodgates for me and I just could not stop thinking about it. And it also goes to show that just having these powers would be wildly inconvenient. For no! And this moisturizer line also just goes to show how wildly inconvenient having these powers would be if you lived literally anywhere else besides the beautiful Australian reef coast. Like, can you imagine if I had to take a dip into the Chesapeake Bay every time I put moisturizer on? I'll pass, thank you. Anyways, this mean girl Miriam is throwing a party for this guy named Byron, who's a swim star who can't act. Um, and the girls can't decide if they really want to set themselves up for failure by going or not. The girls are also testing out their new powers and taking up Lewis's secret fishing spot. Well, I might just join you all for a swim then. We're naked, Lewis. 
just a quick dip then. Goodbye, Louis. The girls come home and complain about their powers, and I don't even know what this means, but I agree, Ricky. It's ridiculous. You just made an instant icy pop. Anybody else would love to be able to do that. You've both got these amazing powers, and all you do is whinge, whinge, whinge. So Cleo decides that she's gonna go and just pretend that she is a cold. And we get this horrifying POV shot of Zane trying to throw Cleo into the pool. And again, why is Zane out for Cleo? Why did they have to use this shot? We don't know. But luckily, everyone decides immediately to go right inside as they throw Cleo into the pool. Everyone except for Lewis. Lewis! I didn't think you were coming. Oh no, I was just cruising by. I thought I'd drop in. What's with the fishing gear? I never leave home without it. So, Lewis finds out that they're all mermaids and he saves the day. While they escape, Ricky dries out the pool as she leaves and we get this incredible special effects. Convinced me. Perfect. Episode 3, Catch of the Day. Nasty. You don't want to mess with one of those. Have you ever seen a great white dog? Only once. Took half my catch for the day and shredded my neck. You don't mess with them. They'll rip you to bits. Tiny bits. Little, teeny weeny bits. Teeny weeny, itsy bitsy little pea, pea sized little bits, little shark bits, little bite you, bite you bits. Cleo is still being super angsty about being a mermaid and having all these cool powers and being super hot and being Phoebe Tonkin, but she's also all about saving the turtles. <laughs> thing that's ever happened to us. Probably the most amazing thing that's ever happened to anybody. Well, what about the turtles? So Emma and Ricky, while they're out swimming, decide to free a turtle and they use a knife on the fishing boat to cut them free. And so of course they accidentally start a wild rumor that there's a great white shark swimming about. And of course Cleo, in her desperation to save the turtles, gets caught in it herself and the girls come to rescue her and they're all saved. Also at the end, Cleo says that she wants to show Louis something and the girls just immediately go underwater. So like they realize that he can't see anything, right? <laughs> Episode 4, Party Girls. Episode 4 is important because this is where we meet Mrs. Chatham. So Cleo works at SeaWorld, and as she's working at SeaWorld, she gets approached by Miss Chatham, who is totally not an old mermaid. And Miss Chatham just has the most mysterious, indirect way of talking about things, and it, I I love it. Try this. Timed well, wouldn't you say? Hi. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Mm. Nearly got salt water in my eye. Would have stung. It does sting, doesn't it? But not when you're actually underwater. Why is that, I wonder? I don't know. Lots of things are a mystery. Still, you've got time to learn. Staying dry, that's the big one. Maybe you'll be all right. Thank you. What do you mean? Like imagine having a conversation like that. Don't go. What the fuck does that mean? I don't know what you're talking about. Episode 5, Something Fishy. Then Kim finds Cleo's diary, and when she you know it, Cleo has done a full-on bullet journal spread on how she is a mermaid and has super cool powers. So Kim makes it her mission to out her sister. I guess she really wants her to be taken by the government and torn to pieces. Like, I don't really know what the goal is here. And so Kim employs Emma's little brother, Elliot, who is just like the cutest little boy ever. I'm not reading someone else's diary. It's for your own protection. It's private. Listen. Well, I was taught to resolve conflict with communication. Communication is for humans. They are not human. But Cleo manages to gaslight Kim into thinking Miriam is actually a mermaid. And then when Kim tries to publicly out them all, she looks like a clown. So, the secret is safe. Episode 6, Young Love. Alright, this episode is super filler, but there are too many funny moments that I just had to mention. First of all, Elliot is like, watch this, and then immediately starts drowning. Love that. That may or may not happen to him. I trust you. Do you know I'm gonna be a pro surfer? No one said I'd have to talk to you. Watch, I'll show you. Elliot, quit showing off. <laughs> And Emma and 
Cleo are like, that was real risky going to rescue Emma's brother, Ricky. Like, re you really should have let him drown. And they're also upset that Ricky isn't entertaining Elliot's weird little crush on Ricky that he has after um, they've trauma bonded. Of course, Ricky and Elliot get trapped in a greenhouse that's going to automatically spray water everywhere. But luckily, Emma uses her overpowered ice powers and they manage to escape with the secret staying safe. Episode 7, The Moon Spell. Is Chatham is back to give us another mysterious warning, this time about the full moon. I've come to warn you. Warn me about what? Don't ever talk to Sea Perch. You can't trust those fish. Why would I talk to fish? Listen carefully. It's very important. You must not look at the moon's eye. The moon's... The full moon. It's dangerous. Do not look at it or its reflection. And when it's out, do not touch water. Whatever you do. So the full moon has a bunch of unexplained powers. The full moon is, of course, how they got their powers as mermaids, but also if they look at the full moon, look at the reflection of the full moon, or touch water during the full moon, they all get weirdly like horny and really want to out themselves as mermaids, and they also want to eat a lot of fish. It's not really clear what what it does. It also sometimes makes their powers stronger. It also sometimes makes their powers disappear. It really depends on the episode. Emma, this episode, gets hit with the full moon, and she just starts eating a bunch of fish and making out with Byron. I think you'd like this one. Gross. You look way too young to be Nate's father's girlfriend. I beg your pardon. I guess you just after the money though. Here, Byron. Cool, you got the spa going. How's the water? Come over here and I'll show you. Come closer, Byron. Come closer. Have you been eating sardines? Honestly, this episode's not all that crazy, but then at the end, she apologizes to her dad for ruining his birthday party, and it looks like they're about to make out for like way too long. Love you, that was the full moon curse for sure. The Denman affair. In this episode, we meet Dr. Denman, who is a renowned marine biologist, and Lewis gets a job with her so he can use her tech to research their mermaidness. It's the ion evaporator. <laughs> the atomic absorption photometer. How about we start with the mop? <sighs> you how you are you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine but you just can't get and of course he leaves cleo's toenail in her laboratory and dr timon realizes that he has a cell that can change from one thing when it's dry to another thing when it's wet and it looks like their secret's about to get out of but lewis luckily takes back the cell and deletes everything i'm sure she won't be back to look into that further or have any further questions nope Nothing's gonna happen there. Episode 9, Dangerous Waters. Cleo's fish dies. Into the deep. Somehow I thought he'd sink. Rip Pluto. Ricky starts selling wild caught fish to a super shady man she just finds on the pier. And for a woman who turns into a fish anytime she gets wet, she sure has little to no sympathy for these fish just being ripped out of their natural environment and sold to the highest bidder. But Ricky's black market fish does give us this iconic shopping montage, so I can't be that mad at it. And when Ricky realizes that she's being scammed by this guy, she decides to commit... I mean, do we count them all together? At least one attempt of manslaughter. She tries to boil a man, for sure. You're in a long way out of your depth here. You'd be surprised how far out of my depth I can go. Terrible if uh, one of you were to get, oh, I don't know, scolded? I hope you'd be covered. It's hard to get insurance in our line of work. Pity. I sense an accident of waiting to happen. But not to me. Yes. To you. Ricky, stop it! Not till I say so. 
Episode 10, The Camera Never Lies. In this one, everyone is competing in a short film contest, and this is where we learn that Zane has daddy issues. But you can change him. I broke it by 35 minutes. I got newspaper articles from the library archives. It took me hours, can't beat natural grace. This is great. You know, my record will still be standing in another 20 years. Somebody might break it. No way. Mako Island's a sharp breeding ground these days. Nobody will ever break my record. I'd kiss the feet of any man who could pull off what I did then and keep all of his limbs intact. And Ricky saves Zane from sharks uh, while she's filming for her submission. And this episode is especially important because this is where we get our first Ziki moment. You're good. That's in, you mean? No, the whole thing about been surfing around Mako and everything else. Two guts. You're the only one who thinks so. Yeah, Tiki was my favorite ship as a child because, what can I say, I like to be hurt. Episode 11, Sink or Swim. This episode is really boring, mostly because it's very Byron heavy and very Emma heavy, two characters I do not particularly enjoy, if I'm being honest. Um, but Emma coaches Byron for a swim race, and, you know, the guy who plays Byron is not the best actor. I thought you were going to inspire me, but you let me down, man. I never thought you were going to turn into some heavy training dragon. But Byron wins! Yay! That's the episode. Episode 12, The Siren Effect. So, it's another full moon and our babe Lewis is coming with the DVDs. <laughs> See, this is why I just want Ricky and Lewis to be my real life best friends. And so it turns out the full moon for Cleo turns her into a siren and she just sings like the most haunting song I have ever heard for way too much of this episode. And it happens to bring all the boys to the yard. Including Lewis. But Cleo friend zones Lewis at the end of this episode. Rip. Episode 13, Shipwreck. In this episode, Miss Chatham is getting kicked out of her boathouse for no reason, other than the fact that she hasn't paid rent, her boat isn't up to code, and it's a hazard to everyone around her, including Zane. And when the harbor master tells her that she's gonna have to pay for some of this, she immediately faints, which I love. We support women's rights and women's wrong on this channel. Time has come for us to act. You can't throw her out. <laughs> And then while trying to skirt the law again, Miss Chatham hits Zane's jet ski for the second time this episode, and so Zane decides to commit, what is it, attempted manslaughter number four? He goes onto her boat and is like shocked and appalled when this old lady has a heart attack because he is harassing her on her boat. And so luckily, Lewis and Emma are nearby and are able to take Miss Chatham to a hospital, but Zane is on the boat when the boat explodes and then sinks. And so Zane is going down. It is not looking good for Zane. And so Emma has to jump into the water and free Zane. And this is when Zane sees a mermaid's tail. Dun dun dun. Episode 14, surprise. Another filler episode, but Zane is now on the hunt for mermaids um, and he hires Lewis to help him hunt for them. And so Lewis agrees, but his plan is basically just to gaslight Zane and send him on a bunch of wild goose chases so he doesn't actually find his mermaid friends. And that works for a little bit, but then of course, Cleo happens to swim underneath them while they're doing their fake research. And so, um, going under then? Not yet. Okay, uh, do you want me to pull up a reading? No, I want you to do macrame. Look, I'll do no, it no, myself. No, no, I've got yeah. it. Zane, I've yeah. got it. Zane, I've got it. Hey! Oh. You idiot! What? You! I can't believe you just did that! I thought you told me you knew how to use this thing! Do you have any idea how expensive it is? I'm gonna have to jump in- And so Zane is not falling for any of these shenanigans. The big chill. So in this episode, Emma freezes Miriam alive, which, let's be real, Miriam is dead now. Miriam is died. Emma has killed her. But this is magic logic, so luckily Ricky's able to like defrost her and she's totally fine and problem solved, yay! Episode 16, lovesick. In this one, there's a dolphin that will only eat from Cleo's hand because this dolphin knows that she's a mermaid. And Zane is also at the dolphin park because he's trying to research um, this mysterious sea creature that he's been finding out about. Hey, look at this! The marine park rescued a pregnant dolphin the other day. How cool is that? Get a life, Cleo. 
And somehow everyone becomes convinced that Zane and Cleo are actually secretly eloping and they're lying about trying to help this sick dolphin. I guess no one can conceptualize like two straight people hanging out without secretly trying to get married. I don't know. Then Cleo's dad says this. The male of the species is a predatory creature, Lewis. If you want the biscuits, you can just have them. That might just be a you thing, bud. This episode once again proves that you do not want to be a mermaid, um, unless you are these specific girls, because it is raining and the girls can't figure out how to go to school because of this, and so Cleo just faints. And because this is Australia and not America, I guess they take this super seriously. He's just gonna call a doctor. Uh, you don't have to do that. I'm fine, really. It's it's not that serious. People don't faint without a reason, especially young, healthy girls. You just stay there and don't move. You know, I went to see a cardiologist a couple months ago because I faint, like, all the time. And the cardiologist told me that um, if I wait 10 years, I might grow out of it. And then she charged me $300. But yeah, then the doctor puts them all on full COVID lockdown. Which again, this is, I'm American, I can't relate to people taking illnesses seriously. Um, and this episode also confirms that Cleo's younger sister, Kim, is a COVID denier. Are we surprised? This is such a joke. I bet you there's nothing wrong with them. The doctor said we're sick. It's a scam. I'll prove it. No, you get the virus. There's no virus. Bad moon rising. So, another full moon, this time Ricky gets hit with it. And when Ricky gets hit with it, she just starts boiling and burning everything in sight. And then she goes off to Mako Island and sets Mako Island on fire. And Lewis rightfully points out that this moon curse makes no sense. But the only safe place is the moon pool on Mako Island. Excuse me, this whole Yoda act, it might work on these two, but I am not falling for it. Lewis. No, it doesn't make any sense. Water and moonlight are what bring on this full moon madness. And now you're telling them to go to the moon pool, which is a pool of water full of moonlight on nights like this. I can't explain it. And then Zane happens to be near Mako Island when Ricky is setting everything ablaze. And so, like I said, the moon makes these girls horny because they kiss and Zane passes out. And that's the episode. Hurricane Angela. A lot of filler, but this episode does show that Kim's main personality is just wanting Cleo to wash the dishes. and. Guys, there is a dishwasher right there. I do not understand why this is such a central conflict to so many of these episodes. Their cousin is here apparently because her parents are splitting up and I'm not gonna lie, she's 100% the reason her parents are splitting up. She's a menace to society. Once was okay, 10 times and I'm going a little out of my mind. But I like the water. I'm out of it. Look, I'm responsible for you two and I'm sorry, but you can't go on the ride again. Not on your own. We're not babies. Not without Lewis. Why did he have to leave? Can we go bodyboarding then? No! Hook, line, and sinker. Uh, this one is for the shippers, for sure. Zane and Ricky get stuck on a rooftop together and they decide to start trauma dumping together about how terrible their dads are. Hot. Red herring. Zane is now convinced that Miss Chatham is a mermaid, because she is, and he manages to find this incredible footage from the 1950s that looks like they just took an HD camera and took an old-timey filter over it, but that can't possibly be what they did. And in this episode, Emma dyes her hair red because Byron kind of told her to. And this, again, throws in some like really weird questions about their powers. So it turns out that if she dyes her hair red, she has to make her hair wet to do that. And so while she is wet and in mermaid mode, her hair is red, but while it's dry, it's normal. And so that just makes me question like, then why are they even bothering taking baths then? Like, are they getting clean while they're taking a bath and then they're just stinky and crusty? when they're dry again. I have some sanitary concerns. But Zane ends up seeing Emma swimming away from the wreckage of Miss Chatham's boat, but he doesn't recognize her because she has the red hair. And also Zane keeps trying to talk to Miss Chatham as if he didn't try and straight up murder her a couple episodes. In the 50s, you rescued a fisherman from a boat wreck. Back then you said you didn't see anything, but you did, didn't you? I saw you sink my boat. Stop playing games. You know something about the creature. You've seen it too. I know a lot of things. 
but you don't. Zane. You're He's like, get over it, lady. What'd I do? Try and sink your boat and kill you? Episode 22, Fish Out of Water. Emma and Cleo pretty quickly realize that Zane and Ricky are dating, but that doesn't really matter. What matters is that Emma's family is invited to Zane's dad's house to talk about a potential business meeting, and Zane's dad pitches that he wants to make Mako Island into Woohoo Island from Wii Sports Resort. I mean, look at that. That is the same island. And obviously the girlies are super concerned about this, but luckily Ricky is able to hit Zane's dad with facts and logic, and the project is temporarily cancelled. And just look at Zane's reaction to this. Zane lets Ricky peg him, for sure. In too deep. Now, something I forgot to mention is the merch, I mean the lockets, that Miss Chatham had when she was young. So, Miss Chatham had two friends similar to Ricky, Emma, and Cleo, and the three of them were all mermaids. And they decided to have undeniable proof that they are mermaids in their lockets to carry around at all times, which seems like a liability. But anyways, um, it turns out that one of the other mermaids passed away and the locket is now being sold in an antique shop. And so Ricky tries to buy it, but of course she can't afford it. And so Miriam sees this and decides that she's gonna buy it and Zane wants to buy it off of her. So Zane has to make out with Miriam to get the locket back. And instead of just giving the locket back, Miriam throws it into the ocean. So we get this incredible scene after Zane goes to retrieve it for Ricky and give it back to her. Here, take it. I got it for you. Ricky, it's wet. So 24, Love Potion number 9. Thankfully this is Byron's last episode. I'm sorry Byron, you seem lovely, um, but you and Emma have no chemistry babes. None, none whatsoever. And also, whoever did Phoebe's hair in this episode, I just want to talk. But the good thing about this episode is that Cleo and Lewis finally get together. I just want to go with the magic. Works for me. I think I could get to like this magic. Get used to it, Lois. They're so cute. Ugh, gross. And that leads us into the season one finale, episodes 25 and 26. All right, so someone is back and someone's on a mission. Dun, dun, dun. Dr. Demon is on the hunt for more crusty little toenails like the ones that Lewis gave before. And Zane overhears this and wants to talk to this marine biologist about his crazy mermaid conspiracies. And for a lady who, see, who has seen cells like transform into different things, she is not on the mermaid train. She's like, I don't know Zane, sounds pretty crazy. But then of course she finds one of Cleo's fish tails and sees it turn into skin. And so then she's full on the mermaid thing. And then, the girls get caught on an underwater ring camera. I hate to say it, I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. I mean, he could be walking down the street, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. So then, the scientists kidnap Lewis and put him on a boat. And then, they kidnap the girls in the moon pool. And Zane rolls up like, so excited to see these hot mermaids. And he's like, oh no, one of them's my girlfriend. How could this be? And he's like, can I please just talk to you, Ricky? As if they're all not in like this tiny underwater cave. Like, bestie, I don't know what kind of privacy that you're gonna get here. Luckily, Zane decides to be a good guy, not a bad guy, because Ricky changed him, as we all could. And so Zane and Lewis help the girls escape, and then Miss Chatham tells them that because it's a lunar eclipse coming up, if they jump into the water at the right time, they will lose their powers forever. And they decide that that's the way to get Dr. Demon off of their case. They do this, they jump into the water with Dr. Demon watching, and so they're no longer mermaids. And Dr. Demon's like, yep, okay, I know I proved single-handedly that mermaids exist, and um, this moon pool has the power to transform animals in ways I've never seen before, but I have no further questions, I'm off. And I'm just like, do you know how many things I would be throwing into that pool on the daily if I realized that, that was a thing? Like, Goose would be in there, second the full moon, Goose is going for a swim. I don't care, I want a mer-goose. But she leaves, 
And luckily, we find out that Miss Chatham was being a little cheeky, and because this is full moon logic, um, the lunar eclipse only stopped their powers for 12 hours. So they're actually still mermaids, don't worry. And that is where season one ends. I mean, chef's kiss, an incredible work of art. Um, and honestly, I think it only gets better with season two. The stakes get higher, we get an incredible villain in season two, if you know you know. And I'd love to know all of your favorite moments from this show because I had so much fun watching this show. I have like, I've been so miserable these past couple weeks, but this show has been like getting me through it. And considering this is children's media from 15 years ago, I think that says something about the quality or about my personal taste. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening. Sorry that you had to deal with me being all sniffly and <laughs> through it, so I hope it wasn't too much of that. Um, and I'll hopefully be feeling much better when I get around to talking about season two. Um, I'm already halfway through the season and have a lot of thoughts already, so it'll be juicy, it'll be spicy. Definitely come back for that, so feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye!